Next, we're going to have a, well, imagine if there was a technology that would actually allow every single provider, every hospital, every insurance company, every pharma, pharmaceutical company doing medical research to have access to your health records instantly, but only if they need it and exactly when they need it. And on top of that, imagine if you could set rules for your health record to where Basically, if you're giving your health record, be it de-identified or with an identification to a, a pharmaceutical company doing research, you would actually get paid, and you could actually set that up automatically. Well, this technology actually exists. It's just not being used this way yet. Um, it's called blockchain, and I'm not sure. Has anybody here heard of blockchain? Raise your hand. Okay, great. So we, we got some people who know a little bit about it. We're not going to go as deep into blockchain as we went into uh, AI, but we're going to give you guys, our hope is once you guys leave, you'll actually understand blockchain. So, or at least on a surface level. So I'm going to introduce uh, Kirill Timaviv. Kirill is uh, a uh, data architect at a, a senior architect at uh, Datar and also the head of uh, the Blockchain Center of Excellence. Go ahead, Kirill. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Kirill, Kirill Timofeev, and uh, I work on innovations and new technologies in financial service sector, particularly blockchain or distributed ledger technology, how people call it today. I advanced it from adapted to passionate category of people around this technology. And uh, before I move on, I need to take, I need to make a little disclosure that uh, blockchain, this is not revolution. This is foundational technology that will have a great impact in two, three, or five years to social aspects, business processes, and technology. There are lots of hype going on around blockchain and I'm here to tell you my heartfelt experience with this technology. So for decades, for the past few decades, we've been working with Internet of Information. And when I send you an email or a file or something, I'm actually sending you a copy. I'm not sending you the original. And that's great. It enables information to be open, to be shared across all the participants. But there is a problem when it comes to assets, like loyalty points, intellectual property, a vote, art, and certainly money. When I send you $100, it is, there are two things that are important. A, certainly you receive that. And B, I don't still own that money. So this is called a double spend problem. And this is known for a quite some time by crypt cryptographers. So today, to establish trust in our society, there are big intermediaries like banks, governance, credit card companies. And there are some funky side effects for that governance. For example, credit score. People dance around, play around with the data, but they don't own it. And uh, overall, that works great. I mean, look, we are still alive. But there are a couple of problems. Uh, so first of all, first of all when there is a centralized ledger and database that slow things down really a lot. It takes me just a couple of seconds to send an email from one side of, of the world to another side of the world, but it, it takes me a couple of days to settle a transaction from the United States to the Japan. Second, it put lots of people out of the global economy. Developing countries, 
even even if I'm not eligible from credit company credit credit cards company, I cannot participate in the economy in that network. And three, big companies and intermediaries, they capture people's data and people no longer own this. So for example, I have within smart scale device at my home and it's still a puzzle for me how to synchronize that within the device with Apple, Apple Health. I don't own the data. I cannot do anything with this. So here's a hypothesis that if there were a distributed ledger, not only the internet of information, but internet of value that, that would be run by millions of participants and where every asset can be transacted, exchanged, and moved without intermediaries, it, it is going to be something good. And this is a blockchain. So for the first time in human history, people can transact with each other without big intermediaries and establish trust in a trustless environment. And uh, I, I, I said this already, that blockchain, it is not revolution. It is not possible to change processes in, in one day, overnight. Adoption, it has longer adoption cycles, but still impact is going to be broader. It's like, in, to, give, to give an example, it's like TCPAP technology. It took around 10, 15 years to emerge into the market and make a difference. And look now, we have internet, everyone uses internet, and so is blockchain. Uh, just to give a, a little bit of technical flavor, how blockchain works. Let's say there is a network of two participants, A and B, and A wants to move assets from his account to another account. So first of all, he cryptographically signs this transaction it's like using email and password, but it's way more secure. Then that participant A submits that transaction to the blockchain. What happens after this, that transaction is distributed and broadcasted to every single participant on that network. That means every, every single participant on that network is going to validate and verify that transaction. And if there is a, some sort of invalid transaction or someone will try to dump, do a double spend attack and move money that he don't have, then a node, a majority of the nodes will reject that transaction. And so it happened, and so this is how settlement happens and consensus. At the end, we have an immutable blockchain and assets finally moves from account A to account B. So to make it very simple, blockchain is about A assets and B moving the, these assets from one account to another account. Just a quick recap that in the blockchain world, there is no single, sing, single centralized and controlling authority there are no intermediaries. The entire snapshot of data transaction is replicated across all the participants in the network and they hold the entire state that allows them to verify and validate transactions, build some sort of chain of custody. That this is the original of the transaction, this is the next transaction and so on and so forth. And ultimately, this is a immutable storage. No one can modify if transaction has been saved to the blockchain. It is not possible to change that data any longer. It will stay in the blockchain forever. This is this is very this is great for audit purposes, and I'll explain later 
in a bit. So what, what you can do to the blockchain? You can move legacy applications and digitize legacy processes. Like with the blockchain, you have a na some native functionality, like immutability, you'll have uh, audit trail. Then you can reduce settlement time. As I said, right, right now to settle a transaction in private equity world, take up to three days. If we remove, <clears throat> if we remove all intermediaries, like clearing houses, custodians, and allow buyers and sellers to transact peer-to-peer -peer dire directly with each other, that would reduce settlement time from days to seconds. Cross-border payments, uh, there are applications on the market already, for example, Ripple, that allows to move money instantaneously from one country to another with as little fees as possible. Know your customer, anti-money laundry. This is another type of applications that you can build on the blockchain. Uh, secret, ballot secret ballot implementation. What we can do with the blockchain, we can easily validate that it is me and me who voted for a decision or for a candidate. And for admin, we can, we can make transaction anonymous. So at the end, we'll see only the result, and admin, one admin node won't be able to tell that this is me who voted for a decision for something. So there are some common similarities around that, these applications. Like A, we generate trust in a trustless environment. There is no single and well-established authority we can create an audit trail, digital audit trail, and make it happen automatically. So these are all symptoms. It doesn't guarantee that if you have, let's say, three points of five, three points of six, this is going to be your perfect, so this is going to be the unicorn for the blockchain use case. But it's going to be a signal that, hypothetically, a blockchain can be available in your scenario. Smart contracts, this is also an interesting construction. Basically, smart contracts, this is an application that is distributed across all nodes in the network. And this is the absolutely the same application without any modifications. What does it mean? That means if we execute that application with some input parameters, we'll get absolutely the same output. What we can do with this, it's speed real time. We can automatically process external and internal transactions. Like either is, if I have Fitbit device, I can uh, capture my medical records and uh, my personal data. And at the same time, co compete with other participants on the network. So for example, if I outstep some, someone, then in a fraction of the second, all other participants will know about this. There are some challenges, though. This is, this is blockchain, this is a very young technology. And there are challenges from legal point of view and technology standpoint. There are many different implementations of the blockchain, like Ethereum, Hyperledger, uh, Bitcoin, Chain.com, and others. And their protocol is very much different. It is not possible to change one blockchain implementation to another blockchain implementation. And uh, what makes the choice more interesting there are not that many blockchain solutions that provide smart contracts. Privacy, another challenging topic. By default, a blockchain, this is an, this is an open network that share data across all participants. So if you need to save some sensitive information onto the blockchain, like social security number or 
highly confidential data. This is going to be a funny exercise. You can either encrypt this or put the data off chain. Performance, I'll give you an example. Bitcoin can settle up to six transactions per second. And let me put it this way. If you need to do high frequency trading solution, blockchain is definitely not an option for you. But if you have, let's say, a pan, if you need to settle up to a hundred of transactions or up to 500 operations per second, then, then potentially, potentially, blockchain could be a nice fit. Legal and regulatory frameworks are not there yet. Uh, it depends on the country in the United Kingdom and in the States. Uh, big companies are working on creating illegal frameworks, but in some other countries, this is still something up in the air that they need to decide. Uh, operational and infrastructure. To that regard, blockchain is going to be disruptive for you. Large, large enterprise organizations have infosec rules and your solution must be compliant to, to some standards. And to the blockchain, that framework does not exist yet. So what we did, we decided to move to clouds. Because in the cloud, when you run your solution in Azure or on, on AWS, you can say that we're compliant to infosec, we're compliant to regulatory, and yeah, some other things. So just to give a flavor how, how it works in real life, this is, this, is, this is the application we completed for a large financial institution, uh, security settlement for pre-IPO companies. So the background is very simple. There are many counterparties, and you'll see this in a second. There are lots of legacy processes. Some companies cannot do even digital signatures and allow only web signatures. And pretty known T plus three settlement process that it takes up to three days to, to, set, to settle a financial transaction. So with the blockchain, our hypothesis, hypothesis was we can reduce settlement time from days to, days to minutes. We can digitize this process, and it is going to be a small step. It is going to be a small improvement to the process as a whole. This is how capital market solution looks at the current moment. There are sellers, there are buyers, there are firms, there are brokers, there are clearing houses, there are custodians, and there is no centralized ledger. And on top of that, there are three main operations that you need to complete. One is you need to match buyer's interest with the seller's interest. Second one, you need to clear and settle the transaction. And clearing usually ha happens at a broker, broker level and settlement on, on a custodian level. On the blockchain, clearing and settlement, this is a, an atomic operation. It happens at the same time. And for the matching, for the execution, this is basically you need to build a platform. And uh, this, is, this is how, from a pure technical standpoint, it looks. There is, a, there is a centralized ledger. There is a blockchain. This is a private ledger. And there are different nodes operating and running on that network. Asset, asset node, it creates assets on the network. Asset manager moves assets from one account to another account. And auditor node, straightforward. It, basically validates that every single transaction that we create is compliant to certain rules. Uh, on top of that, we built a user interface for uh, asset managers, and uh, we brought up an auditor node. So we didn't really remove all intermediaries from that process but we made a small step how to improve settlement process as a whole. Uh, if I may, there are a couple of recommendations that I can give you. Start small. Uh, 
if you, if you do blockchain, always start small. It is not possible to substitute any existing processes. Find a small problem and find a small use case and create POC first. Then blockchain, this is a network of participants who trust each other. So consider making a partnership with another company who is interested in solving this particular problem. And uh, for improved peace of mind, use private chains. Don't go public. Thank you. All right, so are there any questions for Kirill? No, everybody wants a drink, huh? <laughs> oh, we got one back there, okay. Daniel Song from Health Read, thank you very much. That was very helpful. I got a quick question for you. Um, there was that very high profile um, theft of Bitcoins or cryptocurrency from Mt. Gox. Now that I understand how the blockchain works, I'm not clear I understand how they actually managed to steal the Bitcoins. I mean, if it's, if it's, if all the transactions are stored in a public ledger, how does someone steal it? So, so Kirill taught me a little bit about blockchain. So my understanding is that was because of smart contracts and the way they put together the smart contract, it caused there, there to be a way for the thief to basically manipulate uh, the contract and get the Bitcoins. Am I right? Uh, there are two parts. So yes, parts. For, the, for, for, the, for the smart card contract, that's absolutely correct. And the second part is how exchanges work. They manage your private keys. So you're not the one who owns your private key, but it is also exchange who, can, who works, let's say, as a transfer agent. And uh, to, to a certain extent, if an exchange can manage your holdings or bitcoins on your behalf, and that exchange is compromised, then a hacker can steal your holdings. But it has very little to do with the blockchain technology. So there are two parts, smart contract, this, 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 is, this is one and then in infrastructure of exchanges. Anybody else? There you go. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry. Henry Chalian, uh, quick question about, uh, everyone talks about coins. I think that didn't come up. Are there, do you see any potential with using coins in healthcare um, and blockchain? Since everyone is going to be doing it, apparently. That's a, that's a good one. Uh, the answer is no one really knows. And it's easy to predict the future. It could be anything five or 10 years from now. Uh, my personal opinion that there is, there is potential. For example, pers marketplace for a personal data. When you own your data and you can sell it, Let's, let's say, let's put it this way, uh, your medic, medic, medical records, right? Right now there is no database that holds the entire snapshot of your medical records. And if you had, it, if you had an, such option, you could anonymously sell your data to companies that may do research based, based on the data. So it highly depends on the use case. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, there are not that many applications and case studies in healthcare industry, but uh, this is the very beginning. Yeah, also another thing that, you know, it doesn't have to be Bitcoin. There can be a, a, a value token of some other uh, type added. So if you were to give a company access, maybe your insurance company would give you a token and that token would give you a percentage off your, your uh, healthcare insurance or, or do something else. So as Kirill was saying, it's, it's the internet of value. 
So it's the ability to, to move information and value back and forth. So if this technology was out there, you know, back when Napster first came out, you never would have been able to share uh, um, music with each other because to trade it, somebody would have to pay you and they would actually get the original. So that's kind of the, the whole idea behind it. You're moving value, not just copies of data.